Hi, Dave here. This archaeology video is about one of the world's most fascinating archaeological sites, Gobekli Tepe. It's been discussed a bit in the media recently, so I've decided to give my perspective on it. I've read up every report I could find produced by the excavation team, and read through the last 18 months of entries in their blog. My sources are listed down below as usual. A lot of the images I'm using here are property of the German Archaeological Institute, and they're used here with their permission. I've got a link to their blog, the Tepe Telegrams, down there too. If you have an interest in the site and want to get updates on the project, I highly recommend subscribing to it. That way you'll be getting information from the project team themselves. Gobekli Tepe is a tell or artificial hill in southeastern Anatolia in Turkey, near the Syrian border. It's around 15 metres high and 9 hectares in area. It was first mentioned in a survey by archaeologist Peter Benedict, published in 1980. The site was recorded as V-52-1, a rocky limestone ridge with a complex of round top knolls, the two highest having cemeteries atop them. He found five sherds of pottery, six flakes of obsidian, and 3,000 pieces of high-quality flint during his survey. Klaus Schmidt visited the site in 1994 and noted the presence of broken chunks of pre-pottery Neolithic architecture amongst the rubble including parts of the now-famous T-shaped limestone pillars, one of which a local farmer was trying to break up with a sledgehammer in 1995. As a result of the discovery, Schmidt led several campaigns of excavation on the site undertaken by the German Archaeological Institute and the Museum of St. Leofa. Klaus Schmidt died in 2014, but the project continues, and as a result we now have over 20 years of archaeological research to look at to see what's been found so far. The stratigraphy of Gobekli Tepe is actually reasonably straightforward. The archaeologists have defined three layers. Layer 1 is surface soil produced by erosion processes and contains a ploughed horizon. There are flint flakes and ceramic sherds in this layer, but it's not really of much interest compared to what lies beneath it. Layer 2 dates to the early to middle pre-pottery Neolithic B period, 8800 to 7000 BC, and contains small rectangular structures around 3 by 4 metres with terrazzo floors, meaning that they're made from lime fragments and clay, then smoothed. They either have no central pillars or two pillars, in the same style but smaller than the earlier ones found in layer 3. This one is called the Lion's Pillar Building. This totem pole was found set into the walls of one of the rectangular structures. It is three carved figures, one atop the other. Rectangular structures like this with T-pillars have been found elsewhere. This is the cult building from Navali Kori, a pre-pottery Neolithic B site, also in southeastern Anatolia. Layer 3 is the one that's attracted the most attention, and for good reason. It dates to the pre-pottery Neolithic A period. 9600 to 8800 BC, and has large circular or oval enclosures with massive T-shaped limestone pillars. These structures appear to have been used for a long period of time, extending into the pre-pottery Neolithic B period. We'll look into these in detail later. Some structures were identified that had properties intermediate between layers 2 and 3, and have been labelled 2A, or undefined. One key factor about these dates I'm throwing around here is that Gobekli Tepe's early monumental architecture predates the adoption of agriculture. These structures were built by hunter-gatherers. That makes this place very special indeed. The site is located on the hilly flanks of the Fertile Crescent. Wild plants such as einkorn, barley, almonds and pistachios were plentiful at the time. And animals such as the goited gazelle, aurochs, red deer, onager and wild pigs were hunted. This map I've drawn, cobbled together from the maps presented in different articles, shows the excavations as near as I can work out. You'll notice that the layers are not simply one on top of the other. It's not that simple, as the modern ground surface has little relation to the original one where the layer 3 structures were built. Another important factor to note with this site is the fill. All the structures are filled with limestone rubble, sourced from the nearby quarries. It appears to have been backfilled deliberately, though it has been posed that the buildings could have collapsed and were infilled by erosion from higher on the mound. The fill contains fragments of flint artefacts, numerous animal bones and some human bones, though there have been no burials found at the site. Almost all the artefacts found at Gobekli Tepe come from this fill layer. What this means is that they're all in what archaeologists call secondary context. They've not been deposited where they were used or discarded, which would be primary context. This means that the artefacts could be remnants from the use of the structure, 
and the rubble could even be part of the structure brought down the demolition, or the collapse. Or they could not relate to the structure's use at all, and may instead be refuse from the peoples who backfilled it. Assuming it was backfilled deliberately, that is. When one first looks at the site map, the first instinct is to think this is a settlement. The many small rectangular enclosures look like clusters of small houses. There's a problem with this cursory interpretation, though. The archaeologists have not found any evidence of their being used as residential structures. No fireplaces, no ovens, no artefacts usually associated with domestic life at that time in this part of the world. And there's no water source at the site. It's not to say there's no domestic structures there, just that the archaeological team have not yet found any. This leaves the archaeologists with little choice but to assign these structures a ritual or religious use. And yes, I know, this is an age-old archaeological trope, meaning we don't know. But it seems to have some support from the evidence here. All right, the main attraction for Gobekli Tepe for most people is the monumental architecture and raised relief carvings. So let's take a look at the enclosures. They've been labelled A to I by the archaeologists in the order in which they've been found. Ground penetrating radar surveys of the site suggest there may be around 20 of these enclosures in total. I'll go through them in alphabetical order. Enclosure A is the southernmost excavated enclosure. It's a bit more rectangular in shape. It's not as old as enclosures C or D. The pillars that have been exposed so far are dominated by snake imagery. Pillar 1, one of the central pillars, has a net, possibly made out of snakes, on it. And this is Pillar 2, with a bull, fox and crane on it. Enclosure B is round, 10 metres in diameter, and 8 of its pillars have been exposed. There aren't a huge number of carvings in this one, but the ones that are there tend to be fox-themed. The floor of this enclosure is terrazzo, and a stone bowl has been set into the floor under one of the central pillars, with a fox relief carving. It's a largely subterranean structure, and has to be accessed from above. Going back to this picture, it illustrates a couple of points about the enclosures. The outside pillars are connected by thick limestone walls, with blocks bound together using clay as a mortar. This clay mortar has proven to be extremely vulnerable to rain, wind and insects, and has necessitated the covering of much of the excavation to protect it from the elements. This leads to my next point, which is that it's quite possible that the enclosures were originally roofed structures. There's an academic article about this by Dietmar Karapkat from 2014 on the subject. One factor, for example, is the large central pillars of enclosures C and D are not stable in their sockets. If there was a roof connecting the tops of the pillars with the walls, this wouldn't be an issue. The roof would, of course, protect the fragile clay mortar of the walls from the elements as well. This reconstruction of a possible roof arrangement shows a rectangular porthole stone in the roof, much like the oculus in the Pantheon in Rome. If we go back to the earlier picture, you can see a porthole stone lying in the fill in the middle of the picture. These porthole stones also appear to have been used as doorways in the walls of the enclosures, and one was exposed in situ in the northern wall of Enclosure B, flanked by two very happy-looking foxes. Enclosure C is one of the two enclosures that the team has excavated all the way out. It has three, maybe four, concentric rings of walls and pillars, and the carvings are primarily wild boar-themed. At some point in time, someone dug into the tell to access the two tall central pillars of Enclosure C and smashed them then backfill the rubble. The fragments have been excavated, laser scanned, and digitally reconstructed to a height of 5 metres. The floor of the enclosure is solid bedrock, with two raised pedestals retained to support the central pillars. Like enclosure B in its latter phase, it was largely subterranean. I say phase because it appears that the concentric rings of walls were erected one inside the other over time, the inner ring being the most recent. Another feature of these enclosures is clearly visible in Enclosure C, a bench running right around the inside of the walls, presumably to provide seating. Two stone bowls and a boar sculpture was found on the floor of the enclosure. Another cool feature of Enclosure C is a staircase leading up to the entrance, which is a large U-shaped stone. Enclosure D is the largest and best preserved of the enclosures excavated so far, dug out right to its bedrock floor. Its central pillars are 5.5 metres high and weigh 8 tonnes, and they're surrounded by 11 to 12 outer pillars. The carvings in it are diverse with many foxes, snakes and birds. The two central pillars have anthropomorphic carvings on them, carved arms, hands and loincloths. A replica of this enclosure has been built in San Leofa's Archaeological Museum. One thing that is apparent is that despite the size of the structure, 
that would not be able to accommodate that many people at once. And if it had a roof, only lit through an oculus and artificial lighting, I don't know if they had candles or oil lamps at the time. I don't think there's much evidence for it. The space would take on a very confined and eerie nature. All of these enclosures are located very close to one another. Enclosure E is a very different creature, located to the southwest on the rock plateau. Its bedrock floor is exposed at the modern ground level, and it's missing all of its pillars and walls. The two pedestals and sockets remain that would have supported its two central pillars. Enclosure F is located on the southwestern hilltop. It and Enclosure G are quite a lot smaller than the others, and located close to the surface, meaning that they're probably later, but they're undated for now. Enclosure G is a small, only partly excavated enclosure next to Enclosure D. Enclosures H and I are the most recently uncovered. They're located on the northwest hilltop, which has been the focus of the most recent archaeological work. Pillar 51 is one of the central pillars of H, and shows a leaping big cat. A really impressive double porthole stone was found here, with high-relief decoration of a bull, goat, and a predator, and a low-relief decoration of a large snake. So what about the artefacts? A team have found some amazing stuff while doing the onerous work of digging out all that rubble from the enclosures. My back hurts just looking at it. Do remember, though, that these artefacts were found in secondary, not primary, context. They've not found much obsidian, but quite a lot of flint, which is not sourced at the site. Beautiful Byblos, Nemric, and Hellwound points are commonplace. Zoomorphic pestles or scepters of the Nemric type have been found ornate, thin-walled stone bowl fragments and small stone tablets, and some beautifully polished stone buttons. As you'd expect from such a huge archaeological find, different studies have been undertaken on the site looking at specific aspects of it. Are the different animal designs totems of different clans? So many questions can be asked. As is usual in archaeology, questions are easier to come by than answers. Some people have looked at the huge megaliths and balked at the size of them, and the fine craftsmanship that went into the carvings, and gone back to tiresome and downright ridiculous ancient aliens' arguments to explain them. The source of these pillars is actually quite well known. The limestone quarry is nearby, and much like has been seen in the Moai of Easter Island, there's still a large T-shaped pillar sitting there that broke while being quarried, and was abandoned in situ. There's plenty of evidence around the world for Stone Age people quarrying, carving, and transporting enormous megaliths. An ethnographic study in the early 20th century in Indonesia documented 525 men hauling a 4 cubic meter megalith 3 kilometers in 3 days using a wooden sledge. An experimental archaeology project looking at the Moai statues in Easter Island saw a team of 18 people move a huge stone statue with nothing but ropes walking it by rocking it back and forth, the way you'd move a heavy appliance like a fridge. Experimental archaeology has also been conducted into the creation of these limestone megaliths with flint tools. A team of 22 skilled, or 44 unskilled, people could quarry out and shape a pillar the size of the Gobekli Tepe ones within four or five months. Prehistoric people could do amazing things, and they should not be underestimated. I'm impressed, but not surprised, by the stonework at Gobekli Tepe. If you don't believe me regarding the use of human power to move large objects, go check out this YouTube video of a single man moving and erecting huge concrete blocks by himself, using only technology available to Stone Age people. One thing that really sets Gobekli Tepe apart is that it was constructed by hunter-gatherers. Agriculture was taken up in the centuries after its construction. One theory posed by the project archaeologists is that the gatherings at ritual centres like Gobekli Tepe put pressure on local food supplies, trying to get enough food for the feasts required to feed the crowd. This pressure resulted in strategies to secure a more reliable and plentiful supply of food, resulting in the domestication of crops. This is a complete flip of the old theory that monumental architecture arose out of the larger populations and social hierarchies that resulted from sedentary agricultural societies. Feasts, whether they be for the workers building the place, or the people using the completed spaces, must need something to wash down all that food. As I already mentioned, there's no water source at the site. Six large limestone basins have been found in the complex so far, with capacities up to 160 litres. Residue from the bottoms of these basins has been chemically tested, and faint traces of oxalate has been found. The study is still tentative, and more work has to be done, but oxalate is produced through the steeping, mashing, and fermentation of cereals. 
so it may be that Gobekli Tepe contains the earliest evidence yet of the brewing of beer. We'll have to wait and see. A study entitled Decoding Gobekli Tepe with Archaeoastronomy, What Does the Fox Say?, was published by two engineers from the University of Edinburgh, who hypothesised that the enclosures were used as observatories, and that some of the carvings commemorated the Younger Dryas Comet impact, particularly Pillar 43 and Enclosure D. This has been thoroughly debunked by the project archaeologists in another article, which was very detailed, systematic and respectful. I've been out of academia so long, I was honestly surprised. I'm used to YouTube debunking videos, so I was expecting a bit more ownage and mockery in the article, and in the resulting response from the engineers. That's not to say the German Archaeological Institute hasn't come up with some out-there theories of their own. Recently, a study of the human skull fragments found in the fill has resulted in an article proposing a Neolithic skull cult at Gobekli Tepe. Let's take a quick look at the evidence behind that. The archaeologists have found 691 fragments of human bone so far in the fill of the excavations. 480 of these fragments are from skulls, which is a high proportion, and 40 show evidence of cut marks from defleshing. Two vertebrae show evidence of decapitation, and seven fragments from three individuals have potential ritual modifications. One of them has a post-mortem drilled hole in it, and three examples have carved grooves. There's some traces of ochre on one of the skulls. They've posited that the carvings and hole could have been used to suspend the skulls as part of some ritual display. This, combined with some of the iconography carved on the pillars, has caused them to propose the skull cult hypothesis. I can understand where they're coming from here. Still, personally, I'll wait for more of the site to be excavated and a much larger sample of the remains to be collected before drawing any conclusions. I imagine, given the high-profile nature of the site, the demand for results from their work, and the publish-or-perish nature of academia, that that's easier said than done for them. After 20 years of excavation, Gobekli Tepe leaves us with far more questions than answers. And that's part of the nature of archaeology. As the archaeologists uncover more and more of the complex, hopefully some of these questions will be answered. But I suspect new questions will arise as well. C'est la vie. This is a brilliant, ongoing archaeological project. It's academic archaeology at its finest. I'm thoroughly impressed by the work of the archaeological team at Gobekli Tepe. I highly encourage anyone interested in the project to follow the link down below and subscribe to the Tepe Telegrams blog to follow what they uncover next. I sure have. I'd like to give a special thank you to Jens and Oliver for letting me use the fantastic images of their project in this video. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe. Cheers!